Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to, well, this is, a, I guess, an episode of Humble Fish and Friends, but we're calling this Budget Reefing. Uh, we're, we're starting a new series where, you know, obviously, I think we all know that the, that the, uh, the cost of the, the hobby, everything is, is going up, you know, from livestock to equipment to tanks, whatever. So we wanted to start a, um, wanted to start a little um, a series called Budget Reefing, where we share tips and tricks and other things to help you, um, you know, help you save money in the hobby, help you participate um, in the hobby on a budget. So the very first uh, episode that we're doing right now is called Inexpensive Yet Beautiful Fish. And uh, TJ Ingalls, who a lot of you know on the forum as Eat Breakfast, is our fish stocking expert. And he's going to uh, do a presentation and we're going to have a little bit of a discussion. And at the end, we'll have Q&A. So, uh, TJ, you know, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, I really respect you tremendously, your knowledge in the hobby, especially when it comes to, to, to fish stocking and just knowledge about fish behavior in general is I, I feel second to none. So I want to thank you for, for doing this for us. Well, my pleasure. And thank you for the kind words. <laughs> that, uh, that means a lot. It gives me confidence, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we wanted to talk a little bit about budget reefing because as Bobby mentioned, prices have been, prices only go up. They don't seem to ever come down on, on this, and especially since COVID, right? We had a lot of issues where things were getting bumped on flights. Uh, and so then the prices seem to skyrocket then. And even when things stabilized a little bit, they, they didn't really come back down to where they were before. And uh, I've been on the saltwater side of the hobby for uh, over 15 years professionally. Um, and so I don't know if you're like me, if you've been in, in the hobby in that, any period of time like that, where basically when you entered into the hobby, that's where the prices seem that they should be. And you, you have a hard time buying stuff that doesn't fit within that price range or even close. But, you know, we all have to adjust at times. So uh, what we're doing with this is kind of my mindset is kind of going back to the basics a little bit think about that new hobbyist energy and how you were looking at things uh maybe even right before you got in the hobby and why you wanted to do salt water and perhaps you said it and even if you didn't say it you definitely have heard it saltwater fish are just way prettier than freshwater fish so you kind of have that idea going in and, and you want to do things and then and whether it was seen at a public aquarium uh seeing like reef shots on a tv show or just going to somebody's house and seeing a really nice tank. So there's usually like those one or two fish that just pop for you. And for my wife, who's not interested in the hobby at all, she could not tell you even a clownfish, it's gonna be a Nemo fish. She has her pick are Antheus, right? So it's like they're smoothie fish to her because they've got the pinks and the pastels. So that's something that draws her, even draws her attention to somebody who just doesn't even care. Um, but what happens to us is we gotta get in the hobby, we gotta get a little bit more knowledge and Knowledge can almost be a danger. It can almost be a detriment uh, because we kind of start to learn about rarer fish, uh, harder fish to acquire. And so they end up having an attractive quality to us because it's a desirable thing. But really, they're not any prettier than some of the super common ones. So let's uh, take a moment and look at some of the, uh, the what we can call budget fish. Uh, pretty, uh, but it's still inexpensive. And so what we're going to do is just take a look at a handful of species at a time, and we're going to look into this and discuss them and why we should take a, a new look at them. So the first one we've got here is the firefish. And there's a reason why we see them in the hobby so often is because they're small. So basically, even as small as a five-gallon tank, you can house one or two of these things with other fish. They're never going to be a problem towards other fish except their own kind um super peaceful they're generally outgoing fish so unless they're being bullied they're going to be front and center in the front of the tank um their price point is usually quite reasonable um anywhere from that 10 to 25 dollar range you're going to be able to walk away with a firefish uh and get a tank and look at the colors on this i mean that contrast between the darkness on the red and that white and they kind of even have like that eyeball shape with that high fin so there's a lot of interesting things about this. Now, something to keep in mind is they're going to be a jumper. Uh, anything that has that missile elongate shape, they're going to just shoot right out of that water um, if they get startled. So you definitely need a good lid. And then I mentioned how they can be aggressive with their own species. 
So something to keep in mind is keep them singly or as a true pair. Now it's, we don't know this for sure. It hasn't been discovered whether they actually change gender or uh, remain the same gender. Uh, but it seems likely in my experience that they just remain the same gender. They don't change sex. So basically you have to find a male female pair and I am not skilled enough to identify them. But if you look at a store, uh, if you're calm, you'll be able to see two fish that are swimming in closer proximity to each other and kind of keeping the other fish to a little bit of a space that's further away. Um, so if you observe in our patient, you can pick out a pair out of a tank of those. And then also one of the notes that I have is that it's unlikely that they've been caught by cyanide. And so this is something that's good because we're trying to be more responsible in our hobby. Plus fish that have been caught with cyanide often have side effects that can be found far on down the road where we can't even identify that it's been cyanide. It just seems like it's a quote unquote weak fish for right. some reason. Um, and so, you know, you never know what you're going to get with some of these, but a fire fish is a good one because they're found in sand flats. So basically what they just do is scoop up a bunch of sand and let the sand filter out. Uh, and then they've got the fire fish there. So there's no need for them to waste the money on cyanide uh, when they don't have to. So that's, that's a po another positive about this, which again is probably why they're so hardy when they come in uh, to the local fish store or even in your tank, even for being such a small piece of fish. Right. That, that's an awesome tip about they don't typically use cyanide to collect these because, you know, we've all experienced, you know, whether it's in quarantine or the DT, a new fish just dies. We don't know why. We, we sometimes in our mind, we think, could it have been cyanide? But we don't really know, you know, why the fish just suddenly died. So that's a great tip to know that these are are typically not caught uh, collect uh, caught use, si using cyanide. So let me ask you this: so th this is the firefish, the red firefish is the common name, but there are I know there's the purple firefish, there's the exquisite firefish. I think there's another type. Are they all as equally um, hardy as the red firefish? So yeah, within reason, right? So the purple firefish is definitely just as hardy, probably slightly hardier. It's a little bit bigger of a species and a little bit bulkier. Um, and then the Helfrix firefish, uh, that's the fancier one. Uh, they're just a little bit smaller, but they're still pretty hardy too. Now, the reason I didn't include those is just on that price point. Like right. I'm trying to look out on that budget. So even though the purple are even, you know, they're cheaper than the uh, the fires, they're still in that 45 to $75 range. And then Helfrix, I mean, you're talking 120 to 180. Yeah. So they're, like, they're that's cool. kind of more of a collector. Like that's a fish that I haven't been able to pull the trigger on because like, I think they're super pretty, but not worth the price jump from when I can have this for $15 uh, versus 10 times that price for something that's a, only a little bit prettier. So let me ask you something about the, I know you said that you, you really, it's not a good idea unless it's a true pair, the same species of firefish to mix and match. Can you mix and match different species of firefish in the same tank? I have had mixed results in that. So again, let me again, let everybody know a little bit of my experience on when I say my experiences on this is I take care of fish tanks for people in the uh, lower Fairfield area of Connecticut and Westchester County of New York. So I'm able to take care of anywhere between five and seven aquariums a day, uh, five days a week. So, and I've been doing this for 15 years. So it's like, we've had a lot of mixing and matching because people want to try stuff and there's stuff that's in the books that says, yeah, you should be able to do that. And I find mixing species is hit and miss on that. So generally you're going to want at least two feet of space per species. Um, otherwise you might have a little bit of just a firefish is going to disappear. And that's kind of what happens with firefish. You don't really see a whole lot of chasing and overt aggression. It's just them flicking that high fin um, and kind of doing like a little shutter and it kind of keeps everybody away. And you can see which ones are the dominant ones. But then again, when you have si size disparities between the purple to the red and the red to the Helfrix, you're going to have the bigger ones are going to win that. So uh, right. just it's something to keep in mind on that. It's, it's mixed results and I would only do it in larger tanks. Okay. And let me ask you another question. It's based on my experience. You can confirm if it's true. I found that when you keep firefish, it's really a good idea to have like rocks with little holes in them so that the firefish has a, has like a hidey hole to retreat into or to sleep into like a den to use. Do you find that's helpful? I just, I find just something that they're able to do. Uh, like, uh, so whether it's just a rock on the sand, like you would for a watchman goby, I find that watchman gobies are actually excellent tank mates for firefish because for some reason nobody freaks out that the firefish go into the hole okay. um and so they tolerate that as well 
And then a lot of literature says that they, uh, them and other dart fish need a sand bed. And that has not been my experience at all. They just kind of want to go to that bottom level and find like a little crevice under there. So a bit, sand generally helps that happen, but it's not a necessity. Okay. Okay. That's excellent. It's another inexpensive fish, a Watchman Gobi. They're not that expensive. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, uh, spoiler alert. We'll see them. Oh. We'll talk a little bit about them later. <laughs> okay. So then the next one that we'll do, we can talk about is the true oscillators clownfish. So the reason I chose this versus any of the other varieties is because this is probably the single most recognized fish as the Nemo fish. Um, and it's cheaper or on par. It's on par with the cheapest of them. And it's cheaper than the Percula or the black oscillaris, which are similar looking. Um, and then it's also usually cheaper than some of the designer clowns. Um, and then as far as out of the clown species, this is probably among the most peaceful clown species. Now, I have had some variants but from pair to pair and individual to individual. So I've had some really nasty oscillaris and I've had some super benign oscillaris. I think it just kind of hit or miss and kind of what's on the dynamics of the tank. Okay. Do you find okay. that the, um, um, the the tank raised clownfish, so used to be clownfish were bulletproof. I mean, that, that was whether you quarantine them or not, they were bulletproof. I mean, they were extremely hardy. But it kind of seems like the tank raised clownfish are more delicate. Um, they they don't have uh, they're just not as hardy as the their their captive their their I'm sorry the captive bred clownfish don't seem seem to be as hardy as their wild caught counterparts. Do you find that's the case? I do find that that's the case, and so a big part of the reason that I find that 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 I believe that that's the case. I, I don't have any evidence to prove this, but I, uh, a big part is just that mother nature is gonna call a lot more stringently than a company that has to make profit, that has to you know, try to get, get as many babies to survive as possible. So when you think about on the reef, these clownfish, they're laying a couple hundred eggs every two weeks. You probably had them do it in your tank if you've had them, if you've had a pair for over two years. Um, and they all just disperse. None of them survive in our tank, but right. even in the wild, most of them don't survive. They, they end up being in a planktonic state for uh, almost a month before they settle down at the reef. And so if even one or two out of each clutch survives and settles on the reef, that's doing pretty good. So, but that's not the numbers that uh, captive raised clowns are doing, right? They're they're trying to get, you know, 80, 90% of that clutch to survive. So some of the weaker ones aren't, aren't are gonna make it through on the captive bred ones. And then as we were talking earlier, we mentioned inbreeding, right? So yeah. it's like, you're not getting an influx of new genes on this. So the reef is great about spreading genes. Uh, the currents take you and wherever you land, that's your new that's your new life now. Whereas again, like the lines that they're using are a little bit limited, especially as they get more selective on what they're bringing in. And it's not just clownfish, it's just we see it in clownfish because it's just so much more numbers in that. Because I'll never forget one of the first batches of captive bred uh, uh, yellow assessors that I got years ago is half the batch had like crooked spines you know so it's yeah. like they're not gonna be there but it, you know we're talking about 15 14 15 years ago when that batch came in and it just like you know they're just happy to be breeding yellow assessors right and so yeah. you see that with the clownfish too and, and so you know you could even on this species like you could even choose the uh the orange skunk clown i find them on par as far as price and temperament but the Ocellaris, it's a classic. So again, if you're right. trying to impress somebody, most people that come and visit your house and are going to be impressed by your fish tank, they're going to, this is going to be one of the top fish that has impressed them. It's, oh, you have a Nemo. So you get bang for your buck as far as crowd pleasing there too. Awesome. Yeah. So then this is just one of the favorites that I like to talk about is some of the small Crisiptera species is, and we have pictured here, we have on the top, the uh, azure damsel then we have the talbot's damsel then we have the rollins damsel so you get color they're super hardy they're very cheap and they're not as aggressive as a lot of the other damsels uh, uh that are available so and these are the small ones because again like uh i'm not including the stark eye in here because the stark eye is a little bit bigger uh than them and it's significantly more expensive but even something like the fiji blue devil or the uh, the just straight up blue uh, Cryptera, they can be a little bit nastier. And then you have similar looking ones to the Azure, like the Allen's damsel, which is in a different genus, and they get it a little bit nastier. So we want to stick with these smaller guys. And what you'll find with them is they'll take a small territory, 
roughly about eight inches square. And they'll just defend that, but they won't go chasing anybody. They won't be causing problems. They won't be relentlessly picking on somebody. And they're cheap enough where you could probably do a group even in a smallish tank. So you could probably do three in a 20 gallon. Uh, you could probably do five or more in a 40 gallon. And so it's something that adds a lot of color, especially if you mix and match these species, if you can get them at the same time. Now you have a variety of color moving in. They each have their little enclave that they choose. And then they're also not super ready to pair off and breed in a fish tank. So some damsels, they'll breed real quick. They'll pair off real quick. And then they get even nastier than they, they were to start with. Uh, but these guys, these guys stay pretty cool, calm, and collected. And so along with that, my next slide kind of is a fish to avoid most other damsels. Because they get, it's tempting to buy them. In fact, a lot of hobbyists are told when they're first getting a tank, oh, put a damsel in there because they'll survive all the cycling issues and, and anything like that. But then the problem is you're stuck with a damsel. And these guys are the absolute worst other than the cruciptoral ones. So, because also once they get familiar with a fish tank, uh, it's near, you pretty much have to take the tank down to catch them if you can't get them to like attack a mirror or something. Because they're also surprisingly fast for that stocky body. They just remind me of like a small featherweight boxer where they'll go after you. You're, you know, you're a hundred times bigger than they are. And they are still, when you're doing the algae, they're hitting that uh, hand. And generally it's always going to catch you when you're off guard. And I've even had one hit me in a tank where there's an, uh, an urchin in the tank. So I get scared, move my hand. And now I've got a bunch of urchin spines in me. So just avoid it in the whole place. Like these fish should not be caught except for somebody who wants to do a damsel tank or for somebody who's going to be doing just something huge, but avoid most of the damsels that you see for five to $10. Right. Right. So basically stick with that other genus that, that you had in the previous slide that that's your best bet. What about the spring, the springeries? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Oh, yeah, spring, that, yeah. Is that, is so that a is great? So they're one of the best. And just the problem is, I was, so A, I couldn't get a good picture of a Springer eye. I found that stock photo with the three of them right there. So it's like, okay, this is perfect. Springer mm -hmm. eyes are awesome. Um, and in fact, it was just on the forum the other day that somebody was posting about a Springer eye because there's two actual varieties that are coming in. So one is probably going to get identified as a new species, but it behaves like the Springer eye. Um, and those are actually even smaller and more peaceful than that other group. So they're like the most ideal of them. Um, as far as that, my only thing against the Springer eyes, and this is picking nits, is that in a dark tank, like if you say, uh, if you've painted your back black or you have a, a black background and it's kind of a darker tank, sometimes they can get kind of get lost in the backdrop because they're okay. such a dark blue. Um, that, but I, I still love them. I think they got a great personality and I, I highly recommend them too. Yeah. So they would fit within that smaller group. So everybody wants those because they eat flatworms, right? So that's one of the big things. Do you find that other damsels of that genus also eat flatworms, or is that unique to that species? It's unique to that species, and I'm not entirely convinced they do the greatest job on it. So I think part of that is their size is because they're smaller than almost all the other damsels is they've kind of had to develop a new niche. But I think like a lot of things, most things that do eat flatworms, they don't really want to eat flatworms because flatworms produce this noxious uh toxin when they're eaten and so some fish are better equipped to eat it but it doesn't mean that they want to so think about it like how brussels sprouts used to be in the 80s so brussels sprouts used to be rubbery and gross and there was a chemical compound uh that would produce like a sulfur um and so we've been able to breed that out over the last few years in uh in brussels sprouts but but it's like i just remember just eating these squeaky nasty brussels sprouts and think about a kid having to eat their vegetables that's probably most of these pest eating fish eating pests they just don't want to do it but they will so if you want to use it for that purpose what i recommend is skipping feedings on sundays um and i just do sundays because it's an easy day to remember and so you feed regular and then they get used to a good feeding routine and so then they're hungry their metabolism is set to eat you know two three times a day and then on sunday they're not eating anything and so now they're looking for food and okay. so it's that that whole going to the refrigerator before grocery day as you look you know what's in there and then you make your several trips, and after your third or fourth trip, you're you're okay eating the pickles that are in the in the back of the fridge. Okay, yeah, that's a good tip. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Sunday becomes a flatworm eating day. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've noticed that because even in freshwater, like you'll get sometimes this uh, little white planaria on tanks, and so skipping a day, it's like that just knocks it out. Like the fish seem to eat that, and it's and it's less food that's uh 
going to the certain types of flatworms that are eating it anyway. Right. All right. So one of the next ones is staple of the hobby. One of the first fish that probably was kept in the hobby because it can be found in American waters. Um, to me, this is just one of the most dynamic color contrasts that we have. Now, I hate the Lakers, but the Lakers with their purple and gold, they got a good color co combo there. And nobody's looked quite the same. So you got the Royal Grama. Um, they can take care of themselves. Uh, they'll take a little cave area, but they're not aggressive. So you may see, uh, see a little bit of chasing if somebody's going towards their cave, but it's nothing too bad. They don't want to pick a fight. They just want to make sure that they've got their spot. Um, it also is a very long-lived fish for a small fish. Um, I've got customers that live uh, that have had uh, gramas for 15 years. So it's like you're getting good bang for your buck. Uh, I wish it were easier to do the harem because that's how they're found in the wild is you'll see this reef face with a, just a hundreds of gramas in there. Um, it's possible to do it, but I only a dedicated person I would recommend to do it, but they're great just on their own too. They don't need to be in that group setting. They, they settle just fine, uh, on their own. So, uh, a highly recommended fish. And I, if I could point out one thing about these, it's nice too. They're, because they're not a deep water basslet like the black cap, you don't have the possibility of usually of a, a you know like like a like a swim bladder problem or mm -hmm. a gas bubble forming in the swim bladder. So that's one less thing you have to deal with with this species. Yeah, yeah, no, they're they're all around. Like I I for a begin for a beginner or an advanced aquarist, I highly recommend it for any tank because yeah. again, or it's one of those. Yeah, it's one of those things that it's going to stand out and people are going to love that fish. This is a fish you can't argue with a fish being prettier than this. This is, yeah. you know, I mean, you can make the argument, but I can defend it. Right. Yes, exactly. And then so then the other ones that I recommend, I, I just love the other Saranus basslets that are found in the Caribbean. So these guys are cheap. You know, it's like you can get them for 15 to 25 bucks a piece. Uh they, I have customers that I don't think that they have a ton of personality. Like I think the grandma has a little bit more personality. There's fish with more personality, but I got customers that just love them. And so anytime I bring, whether it's the Harlequin, the lantern, the chalk or the tobacco, they just love these basslets. These guys are super hardy too. These have been around the hobby for a long time as well. For the most part, they're pretty disease resistant. Um, they survived that early stages of the hobby before anybody knew what they were, they were doing in the eighties. Um, and then what's a nice thing about these guys is you can kind uh, uh they're most easily found from uh, distributors in the United States that actually go out and collect the fish themselves, right? So there's places like KMP Aquatics, some of those guys down in the Keys. There's other there's uh, you know a handful of other suppliers down there. Um, so you're you can skip that wholesaler system, right? So it's like I think that there's a lot to be said for being able to skip the wholesaler is because who knows what's going on there. I think of it as like Grand Central Station or the airport. Uh, everybody is stressed there. So, so it almost seems inevitable that you're going to get sick uh, after traveling there, even if you're masked up and whatnot. And so I think the wholesaler tanks can end up being a lot like that. So being able to directly source them, well, you're skipping a lot of those diseases. And uh, the Caribbean guys, they generally are only sticking with the Caribbean fish. They're not bringing it, you know, they're not being a way station for other places. So it's like I also feel that that's what happens with wholesalers is they're getting that international slurry of diseases and parasites. And whereas this one, even if they are going into a system with other uh, fish from the Keys, it's basically from those waters. So we're limiting how international the disease uh, situation is with these guys. Right. That's an excellent point. Yeah, because I know, like, for example, KP Aquatics, like you mentioned, they're, they're an excellent retailer and they have a lot of these, you know, they only carry like Caribbean fish and like you said, you're buying, they're going out, they're collecting. It's almost like kind of buying from a wholesaler, really. Mm -hmm. And But you're not, you don't have all the disease problems of a wholesaler and then they're shipping direct to you. So, yeah, yeah, I used to buy from them all the time and had very few issues with their fish. They're an excellent retailer. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've had nothing but good experiences with them. So that's why I can't name the other ones is <laughs> because uh, I've only had good experiences with them. So this is something, now one of those avoid slides. So these guys behave kind of similarly to the basslets and gramas, but Dottie backs are nasty as heck. Yeah, now there's a couple exceptions, <laughs> but like Elon Goddess and the Friedmani, those guys are okay. But the fact that the the diadem, the purple, and the bicolor, man, these guys are nasty. Yeah. And so A, I've been in pet stores and I'm trying to like be as helpful with not overstepping bounds um, and 
but I've heard people identify the bicolor as a royal grandma. And it's just like, oh no, 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 please do not make that mistake. <laughs> and and then just like some of those damsels, is these guys are feisty, they know the rock work really well. Oftentimes they'll find a little crevice in the rock. So even if you're trying to get them, you can't get it. You actually have to remove the rock and then they'll come flipping out later. Uh, but these guys, uh, I've seen new guys at the shop put a fish in there with these guys and the fish is in, uh, shredded in minutes. You know, yep. it's like, oh, it's just so frustrating. So I've had to catch a lot of these guys out of customers' tanks. Please do, if you have a question on a, a dotty back, Post it on the forum. Let somebody help you on a species that will be okay. But for the most part, avoid these like a plague. Yeah, I, I hate dotty backs. I think they're also like, isn't the scientific name the Pseudochromus? Isn't that the genus? Yep. Yeah, so look, it's either going to be listed as a dotty back or a Pseudochromus when you buy it at a fish shop. Avoid them. Yeah. And so now another good one is cardinal fish. So I've been on this big cardinal fish for the past two years, cardinal fish kick for the past two years. So, yeah, you see the, the pajama cardinal and the bang guy. Those are probably the two most readily available ones. Um, and what's interesting with the bang guy, right? So there's been a lot of issues on this because it may. there's been talk about banning it in the United States because it's endangered uh, in the bang guy at all where it's found, where it was discovered. But what's happened and whether it's good or bad to introduce a species somewhere else, what happened is uh, it comes out of Indonesian shipments, right? But it's a three-day boat ride to get to the Bali, uh, to get to the Bengay Atoll, to back to where they ship where there's a plane. Um, so what somebody did is they caught a bunch of them, and they released them at the docks uh, along the shore of the main island in Indonesia. And so while they are endangered in their Bengay Atoll, they're actually invasive and found all over the the pier footings. Uh, by the mainland. So it's like they're actually super easy to catch. And that's also something that happened too earlier in the hobby is when they first were coming in, there was a run on them and they were a lot more expensive, but they were also a lot more fragile is because they're taking that three day boat ride coming in. Whereas now it's basically they're scooped up and shipped within that week um, out of the country. Uh, so now they're super hardy, except the problem that I found is they get sold as groups a lot, but they are a strong pair forming fish. Um, and a pair will form and kill off any other Bengay cardinals in the tank. Okay. So again, do that. Uh, some people can identify males and females. I can't do it in a tank. I can do it in big zoomed up pictures, but not in a tank. But what you can do is the same thing with the firefish is you'll find two that are closer to each other and kind of keeping everybody away. And so you can pick out a pair that way. Otherwise, if you're not sure about a pair, only get a single one. Right. Now, contrast that to the pajama cardinal, which has that very similar body shape, but these guys are chill with each other. You could have one, you could have 20 of them, and they just kind of just sit there. They they remind me of an alien that's kind of just doing its own thing. They just kind of seem buzzed out. They almost seem high all the time, <laughs> um, but it's also because they're, they're, uh, they like that crepuscular period of time, that dawn and dusk period of time. Right. So they end up being a little bit more active and behaving more, less zoned out during those periods of time. But they're super hardy. They're long lived for a fish too. You can get, you know, a handful of those, and they'll last you ten years. And then some of the other ones that I like are uh, I've got the orange spot, the orange striped. It's in the top right here, and this is such a cool fish because it's got that bright orange. Um, and in fact, so it's like I've, in my own tank, I have one of these, and I have a swales basslet. Now the swales basslet just hides all the time, but that orange one, he actually almost is like a poor man's uh, swales basslet. So a swales bass is going to set you back, you know, anywhere from 80 to 150 bucks, whereas you can get one of these guys for 15 to 25. So it's like, again, it's that little trade off in that pr a little bit. But for the bang for your buck, again, this is just an awesome fish. These guys, most of them uh, that are uh, in the hobby are small enough where they're not going to cause any problem in the tank. They're not aggressive. Even if you have a big one, he's not going to be aggressive. He just may be able to small, swallow smaller fish. But most of the ones that are offered are on the smaller side where they're not going to eat anything. But there are a couple species that do get big. But this is a great fish, super chill, and some of them can be kept in groups or shoals, um, and others just pairs or individuals, but still a great fish. And another good thing about the Bengay, if if you want to dabble in, in breeding, it's probably one of the e easiest saltwater fish there are to breed. So a Bengay yeah. is great for that, you know, to if you want to you know, try your hand at breeding saltwater fish. 
Yeah, because the, 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 the secrets on that is because the babies don't go into a planktonic state. They're just like miniature versions of the parents. Yeah. And so like if you have either a long spine ur urchin or make a dummy long spine urchin, what they do is just spit the uh, the babies right in there and they stay there. So if you as long as you don't have too high a flow. Yeah, it's a, a great breeding project. Yep, exactly. So then I mentioned Antheus earlier as far as my wife loves Antheus. Uh, but I don't recommend most of them for beginners because there ends up being a lot of trouble with A, getting them to eat, B, feeding them enough, C, some of them really like to be in a social group, but in captivity, they don't know how to play well with each other. So if you think antheists are the, the ones that you see in these giant schools and, and the reef uh, stock photos and stock videos, it's like, and it's usually squamies is what it is. But what happens in the wild is they set up their hierarchy, but there's always a little bit more room for somebody to go or a predator will take them out. In an aquarium, we don't have that. So sometimes these social dynamics don't work out how they should. And so they are designed for the dominant one to bully the subordinates. But in a fish tank, that can be too stressful. There's not enough subordinates to go around. So somebody gets picked on to death and then the next one up gets picked on to death. And then you just end up with a single individual. Well, that's why pink squares are, are great. So, A, the females come in a lot smaller and a lot hardier than the males. In fact, I find that the female pink squares are probably some of the hardiest antheists when they come in. Um, they can, if you have a large tank, they can be kept in a group, but they can also be fine individually. Now, the males are super stunning fish, but the females are underappreciated in their own right because it's still a bright yellow fish. So, if we have that appreciation for the females, you're going to have a hardier antheus. It's something that you can cut your teeth on with it. Um, if it does turn into a male, great. But I wouldn't rely on it for this. But it's it's going to be one of those ones that you can kind of learn, uh, learn their behaviors a little bit. Uh, and it's also an antheus that can be fed just once a day versus multiple times a day like most other ones. Uh, that's huge because, yeah, I know the thing with antheus, a lot of people have to set up like feeders and drop pellets in the tank throughout the day because they need most antheus species need to be fed multiple times a day. How big does the uh, the pink square get? What's the maximum size usually? The see on pink those? Square, a, a full grown giant male. Now, this is going to be the biggest that they're going to bet. And that's going to include the little streamers at the end of the tail. OK, uh, is they'll get to eight inches. Most of them stay yeah. closer to that six inches. Um, so they do need a decent amount of space. However, okay. antheists aren't the most active of swimmers. They kind of want to hover in place, right? They want to kind of be in that one spot where they're just above the rock work, where there's a little bit of flow, and they can kind of kind of do that thing. So along with that, something to avoid is pretty much most other antheists. Because <laughs> especially like we got the purple queen here. I have only rarely seen purple queens work out. Most of them, they'll show an interest in food, but they never actually eat. And the only times I've seen it work with purple queens is where somebody had a school of over 20 of them and he had them in a 20 foot reef. Um, so I think those contributed because I also think that if you do get one that does eat, he can train the others to eat. But to go through that amount of work for that fish when there are other options that are available. Uh, and then also some of them, like they don't, a lot of these uh, slenderer antheists, they just, uh, they don't ship well. Um, they're very prone. All antheists are prone to uranema. I find, which it just, I find that any of the fish that are very social and then at night they kind of huddle together in the rock work. I just feel that touching of each other, it just takes one to spread it to everybody else. Right. And so then once you've got, once you're dealing with that, that's a nightmare. Uh, so it's just now, and then like on the bottom one, I've got a Bartlett's antheus there and they're super pretty antheus, but they can be such a jerk to any, not just other antheus, but to other planktivores as well. So right. now you end up with this guy that's trying to bo be bossy and show off. And then on some of the really pretty antheists, um, it almost seems that the males are designed to be eaten. Uh, like, because the, they'll get deformed, like their noses and mouth and back kind of all kind of like, they kind of almost look like a Quasimodo version of themselves. And I think it's because in the wild, these flamboyant fish that are out sparring with each other, predators just pick those guys off right and left. But in our aquariums, they just kind of turn into ugly monsters. So it's a good thing that we're keeping them alive that long, but it ends up being a downside. And so for most people, as pretty as they are, skip the antheus and get something else. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about leer tails? I find those are fairly hardy and and, and do well. Uh, they do, but I find that they're jerks. 
So okay. like it's possible if you're willing to feed and have high flow, you can keep a group. But I okay. find what happens is over time, they just pick each other off. Um, so a beginner one that I would recommend if you're going to put the work in would be more like Dispars or Randall Antheus because okay. they're a little bit more peaceful with each other uh, and not as rough on each other because I've – because especially with the liar tails, I've had uh, surly females take down males that are bigger than them um, and just kinds of all problems. Whereas like Dispars and Randalls, they kind of respect the hierarchy a little bit. So then there's less uh, fighting in the hierarchy. But but we should we should point out that with all those those other species we're talking about right now, you have to feed them multiple times a day because they have such a high metabolism. They, you know, yeah. so you're gonna have to set up like an auto feeder, drop pellets while you're, you know, in while you're at work because these need to be fed three, four, five times a day. Yeah. And so because well, again, if you get them on a good feeding routine, yes, you can skip a couple days here and there on that or go yeah. down to one feeding every third day or something. But for the most part, because again, like all right, and here's something that I try to tell most people, most fish their stomach is about the size of their eyeball. So if you think about that, they're only going to be able to eat so much, even if you're throwing it in. And I don't like, I prefer feeding multiple times a day anyway for most fish, just because you're, you're just polluting your tank otherwise with uneaten food. So, but your is they need it. So you're going to have to do that. Yeah. I like to do like very small, small, frequent feedings, like very, very small amounts of food, but do it several, like I would, you know, if I'm home all day, it's just like every three or four hours, I'm going to drop just a little bit more food in the tank, a little bit more, a little bit more food. Yeah. And that's, and that's, our, yeah, that just is a good point in general is because I find that a lot of people, for some reason, they get this idea to have the light schedule of their fish tank to mimic the daytime or like, or a lot of times while they're at work. And it's just like, why are you doing that? Like, have your light goes on way later so you can be home and enjoy it in the evening right. rather than it shutting down. Because that, that's what I do. My routine is I'll get home from work. Uh, I make my cup of, of fish food. And then every hour, just pour a little bit in and doing that. So it's the same amount of food. I can keep track of how much food I'm feeding easily. But it's just right. not going to cause the problems. And it, it generally goes a long way for not just Anthea's health, but all fish health. Like most reef fish, that's how it's feeding on the reef is, is food comes by in waves frequently versus, you know, being in a diet, a nutritional desert. Right. So basically like don't have your lights come on until noon and then they go off at 10 yeah. and then you have time when you get home from work to enjoy your tank until bedtime. Exactly. And then you're getting more bang for your buck out of that. Right. All right. So now I love most of y'all who know me know that I love races. Um, I'm actually not going to have too many races on this uh, presentation today, but I had to get one in there and that's the Lubbock's Ferry Rass. So, uh, the reason I chose this one is because there are a few fairy wrasses that come in a little bit cheaper than this, but it, it's more like the Ruber Pinnis or like the Whip Fin, and they're just kind of more of a straight up red. Um, and then like the Whip Fin can be super nasty. And so this, but this is one of the cheaper ones. It's a relatively peaceful wrasse, but it's not one of the super wimpy ones either, because there are some that can just be super wimpy and they get beat up by anybody. These guys can handle themselves. Um, it's hardy for a fairy wrasse. Now with all wrasses, it can be a jumper. Um, and then there's a handful of, this is the only fairy wrasse I've chosen. So like I, I thought about putting the Solarensis, which is now Aquamarinus on the list. Um, uh, but it ends up being a little bit more expensive, but those are great beginner ones because you got a, a splash of color on there without going crazy uh, on breaking the bank. Okay. One question about the Lubbocks. I've had, and it's been years, I've had terrible luck trying to quarantine these they do this thing where they come in and basically it, it seems like it's a like a like a spinal injury where they just basically after a few days they just start basically like swimming uh, vertically in the water just kind of going in circles i've had a just i've just had a low success rate trying to quarantine these i don't know if it's something that the medication is doing to them or maybe they're coming in with spinal injuries or what the issue is have, have you found that's the case I have not found that the case. I do find that, like, because it's not just a Lubbox that I find this with. It's with other fairy wrasses in general. Is they almost seem like uh, they it, it is either a spinal injury or it's like uh, they've stressed themselves out so much that it's almost like a, a neurological like they almost have like the shakes right because it's not the full uh, like it's that vertical swimming where they and they do a lot with their pectorals. But it, like it's a lot of listing, right? Where it's like they kind of just dropping down like that. Yeah. Um. But I do find that if you can get them 
past that, they're generally okay as long if it's not the spinal issue, right? So it's like if you if you've had it for a while and it's suddenly doing that, that's definitely a spinal issue, like right. whether it's started and hit the frames of the tank or whatnot. But when they just come in, I think that they just end up getting uh it's like so stressed out during the whole thing where it's like they're trying to build their cocoon and sit in the corner um and they're just not able so then they try to move and if you've ever seen how people treat these boxes it is exact almost like the commercials uh on things so it's like we're all very careful on our, on our end like oh it says delicate live fish yeah let's be delicate with it but there's getting to, delivered by fedex guys and and UPS and the airport personnel who do not care whatsoever. So I think it's a very scary and harrowing uh, journey for them. And these are, you know, jumpy fish are jumpy anyway. So they're a jumpy fish in your fish tank. Why wouldn't they be jumpy when it's pitch black? As far as they're concerned, they're just in the belly of a fish. They're about to die anyway. You know, that's that's what I think is kind of going on a little bit there. So maybe with them, I'm thinking in my mind, maybe they need a more natural, more natural environment for a QT. Use a lot of like plastic plants and everything, give them a lot of hiding spaces. Maybe that would help with the uh, success rate. Yeah, and I think the methylene blue too. So it's like I'm a big believer in methylene blue just because it darkens the water, right? So it's like most fish are freaked out and being exposed. So if they feel that it's a little bit darker and then they've got somewhere to hide and the water's darker. I think I think a lot of that helps. Like I think it's like one of those things by degrees, right? So it's like we do 12% increase here, 12% here, you know, 5% here. Well, now suddenly we went from you know whatever percentage it was to now you know throw 25%. Now we're at 45%. You know, that's made a huge difference as far as what we're providing for them. So just just a little caveat on that. What dosage do you use methylene blue and how long do you keep them in methylene blue? Oh, so you're not going to like this answer. So when I'm acclimated, so, so when we get them in um, the international shipment, what we do is I got a blue, big blue bin, right? Okay. So I've got a handful of them because depending on if I've got a predator or aggressive fish in there, uh, I'll put it in there. I just eyeball it with a dropper. So it's like I eyeball it and put it in there and then I allow the CO2 when I mix it because I use uh, the, the CO, the five pound canister with an air stone. Okay. And that just like does it. So it's like, that's only on for like seven seconds uh, of the CO2 in there. And just until it's a blue that I like. Um, okay. Okay. So, okay. so it's, like, it's not very scientific. So then what we do is we don't put any of their water in the tank. We just use reef water and then we drip acclimate them. But it's not like a true drip. It's like, you know, we've got the airline looped so that it's weighted, but it's not like a drip. It's just a steady stream. And basically in the period of time that I've put the fish in there, I start putting them away right away. And then we try to have the lights out. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So then let's move to the next one. And so another RAS, this, in my opinion, is the best pest eating solution that's available because for a Halicora species, I find that it's the most peaceful Halicora species. It is a bright yellow. So there's no miss, missing this, no mistaking it. When the males get older and mature, they get a nice, cool orange and green striations on the face. Um, this is just an all-around awesome fish. This is one of the few halicora species that I have seen successfully kept as a harem in a fish tank as well. Um, it's just, you can't go wrong with this. Now, this is a sand-bearing species. So please, if you ever have a sand-bearing species, provide sand. Excuse me. I know that some people have said that they, I, I know of experiences where people have kept like a melanurus or a yellow chorus wrasse in a, a coral tank with no sand. And they're like, oh, my fish is doing fine. Your fish is not doing fine in a sandless tank. And here's how I can tell you this simply, is if you provide sand for them, even if you've had it in, without sand for a, a year, if you provide sand with them, that first or second night, it goes back to sleeping in the sand. They want to be in the sand. Don't stress them out like that. Okay. And what pests do these eat? Do you find these will eat a lot of flatworms? Okay. Um, so it's like I've had great success with those, especially. So right now I do not have SPS in my tank, but I used to have a big SPS tank. Um, and I would do that, you know, weekend trick where it's like on Sundays I don't feed. And I, I know I've had flatworms on my tank and they will knock it off where you don't see them after like two or three weeks from doing that. And I'm a heavy feeder, too. So it's like they just decide on that Sunday that they're just going to hunt, hunt, hunt. Um, OK, so they do that. Do you find these are about on par with a Melanaris or it's better than a Melanaris for? I find that they're on par pest wise, but I like them better because some Melanaris uh, 
specimens can be jerks. So not all, some of them can be fine, but I've had enough jerks where it's like, no, I don't want to waste my time with that. You're a pretty fish melanurist, but you can be too nasty and too bossy. It's one of the more aggressive, like reef halicorus, right? So halicorus is just a messed up genus anyway. So we kind of have to break them down as far as, okay, which ones can you put in a reef? Which ones are maybes? Which ones are definitely no's? And so the melanurus is a usually yes, right? So it's like they may eat some hermits. Uh, but I find that they're generally good with all other inverts, anything big enough. But they can just be a jerk to any other races and anything else that can be they view as competition for their food. Okay. Okay. Good info. That's good info. So then this is one to avoid. I hate this fish. This is my least favorite fish because too many people try it, recommend it to beginners. And this is the species that I have removed from more tanks than any other fish uh, in taking care of fish tanks. Uh, so much so that for the past 10 years, I any of the customers that I take care of, I will not let them put a, a six line in their tank, um, hands down. Like I actually will just like, I know it's your tank, but you cannot have a six line or you have to get somebody else to take care of it because I don't mess with these guys. Uh, they all, And what's, they don't show their true colors right away. So what'll happen is you'll get one and it will be a dream specimen for three months, maybe six months. I've even heard of some people who have theirs that is very nice for a year. Some pe There are a handful of people that swear that their specimen is nice. I have not seen one that over a year personally that has not become a true jerk. They are the nastiest. And if you like other pot eating fish, they will go after them and they will go after their eyes. So especially like with mandarins, I've seen them just gouge the eyes out of mandarins. Um, this is, along with dotty backs, do not buy this fish, please. Yeah, they're, they're nasty. I remember it's it's a different, more expensive fish, but I remember when mystery rasses first came out, it's the same genus. And I was, I was like just enthralled with this fish. I'm like, this is the most gorgeous pink colored wrasse. And of course I went and bought one, just like you said, for the first three to six months, great. And then it grew up into a monster. And I'm like, I hated having to get rid of this fish, but I mean, it was just like a six line. It was, it was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and these guys, so it's like, I, because mystery races will get significantly bigger than the, uh, the six lines do. But mm -hmm. I find that these guys have still all the attitude of a larger mystery race, just compressed in this smaller body. Like they, they almost have like a Napoleon complex about being this size and they just want to let everybody know that they should be the boss. But they, yeah, if you have any experience with it, if you've seen this firsthand, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. All right. So now we're going to move on to the ones that aren't as colorful, but I have it listed as their personality makes them pretty. So these are the award winners and personalities. Blennies. I love most Blenny species as far as this. So he, these are some of my favorites is you've got the orange spotted Blenny. Uh, so those are kind of big. You got the rhino Blenny. Uh, which those are kind of a tinier one, and the stigmaturial blenny, which is another tinier one. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but most people, when they see a blenny in the tank, A, they're like, what is that thing? And people are just drawn to them, um, and I'm drawn to them too. So rhino blennies, I had a group of, uh, of five of them in a 54-gallon corner, and they are so confident in their camouflage that as I'm just scraping the algae off the glass – they're like trying to swim into my hand and perch onto my hand while it's still moving just to see what's going on. So they're super curious. Humans, I think, are drawn to uh, curious creatures because we're curious to begin with. Um, they have the kind of this charm. Most of them have that very flat face. Uh, they also look a lot of uh, characters from SpongeBob SquarePants end up having this very Blenny uh, type face uh, for that. So it's like they're almost recognizable that way. Uh, they recognize you as the fish feeder very quickly. Um, these guys just want to be your friend as far as fish tank, uh, fish go. And they just, a, an award winning, winning personality. Yeah. Really hardy too. Yeah. Yeah. They're great fish. But just as I said, most blenny species are great. Try to avoid the algae or lawnmower blenny. Now they have the personality of a lot of these guys, but they can also be a little bit jerky. These are like the grumpy old men of the blenny group. Um, but the problem with these guys is once their mind's made up that they're not going to eat the food that you offer, they're not going to eat the food that you offer. So I find that a number of these guys will come in and just never eat. And this may not be the biggest problem. If you have a well-established tank, that's pretty large. They, they'll probably find enough of the biofilm to eat. 
but for most people, they don't. Uh, these guys end up having an issue with not just other blennies, but other perching fish. Um, so for the amount of headaches that they have, even though they're cheap and they still have that blending personality, just with the amount of issues with these guys, I would say to stay away from them. And they're a pain to quarantine because, you know, obviously in a, in a quarantine tank, you don't really have a lot of natural food. The only way I can ever get them to eat, and it's only sometimes, is I have to take some nori, rubber band it to a small rock, put it by wherever they're hiding out, hope they'll eat it. Now, some of the larger blennies, like um, I was having problems with aggression with the Midas and uh, the, the well, the Midas blenny, for example, and there was another type of blenny. But I kind of found that it, when I started getting in like the really, oh, the uh, the Starry blenny was the other one. Yeah. I started getting in like the big jumbo specimens. They were a lot more chill than those smaller Midas and Starry blennies that would come out of the rocks and like nip at the fins of fish. It's almost like they're too old or whatever to bother with the aggression have you found that to be the case oh uh, I, I found versions of that and what i attribute that to is probably just more the situation where they were at so it's like if you're the boss and nobody's ever challenging you you're not stressed about it like if you know you have nothing to prove right you're not going to prove anything and i think that that's something that's happened is uh because there's so much competition when fish are first settling into the reef and that's most of the fish that we end up getting right these small specimens they're the ones that are just settling in the reef the fishermen, they're going to catch these guys. These are the ones that can't get into the crevices easy because the more established fish are there. So when they do get some of those more established fish, the more established fish, they're not they're not worrying about their place to live. They already have that all figured out. So when they move to a new spot, they know what to do to succeed, whereas a lot of the smaller ones, they just don't have that skill set yet. Okay, makes sense. So now I said we were going to talk about Watchman Gobies. We're talking about Watchman Gobies. I love watchman goby because you have some super small tiny ones which you know maybe those aren't the best because they can disappear in a tank but most of the commonly available ones even some of the larger ones like the monster one uh they get big but these guys are just big old dopes so and it's not so much for their personality uh that we want them but if you're going to get one of these guys do yourself a favor and get yourself a pistol shrimp because watching these two interact is amazing where they're just checking things out they're just sitting there and pistol shrimp are awesome because they are just always busy um, excavating and working on that. Uh, the hole that they're, they have their burrow. They're like a little mini uh, bulldozer. And so you get a little mini bulldozer with their colorful, pretty watchman goby. Uh, you've got a pair right there, a lot of interaction to watch. And then this is something that you end up talking to your friends about how it's symbiosis in action. And people are amazed to see that there's some two very different species like this uh that cohabitate and actually work together right exactly so i'll point out two things about watchman gobies that i found so number one if you're looking for a goby that's going to sift your entire sand bed this is not the goby for you it's not like a like a diamond goby or something or, or a bella goby that's going to like you know sift the sand keep the sand clean i also point out make sure that all of your rocks are are stable and stable on the glass because these gobies pick a rock usually they like to, you know, dig out a, a burrow, and then if you have a rock there that's not stable, you could have a rock slide on your hands. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I always recommend people to put it on the glass. And so that, then another cool thing that you can do with these guys, if you do have your rock work on the glass, um, depending on how your stand is situated and, and that, is you can go under, and if you can see the glass, you can go under with a flashlight or even a red light. And you can see some of the burrowing network that they've done and see how expansive they are. Wow. Which, yeah. If you're flexible enough, I highly recommend it. Like that's, yeah. uh, that's a cool way of learning about it. Kind of see their tunnels under the rock work. Exactly. So now I have an avoid one in Dragonettes. Now, the, the Mandarin, in my opinion, is one of the prettiest fish in Aquaria. Like these psychedelic colors, it's just, it doesn't even look real. But along with that, though, is almost very rarely will you have an individual that's eating prepared foods. Um, most of them are only looking for live copepods and amphipods that are supplied in the tank. So and what I've also found is that basically you need to budget about 50 gallons per heavy pot, uh, pot eating fish if you're going to have a dragon app. Uh, and so what I mean by that is we talked about the yellow chorus rest earlier. Well, the yellow chorus rest is going to eat a lot of pods. And even though the yellow chorus rest is going to eat the foods that we give him, he's still going to be hunting for those pods all day long. And he's going to decimate it because he's much faster 
than the Mandarin or any of these other Dragonettes. Then a lot of people, they want to have the interactions of having a pair, which it's easy to pair them. Um, but now you, if you've got two, a pair of Mandarins, you're looking at 100 gallons minimum without any other pod uh, in there. Then even if you do have a, t a tank that's big enough, if it's not established enough, you're not producing enough pods. They'll eat, a single individual is going to eat between seven and 9,000 pods a day. And so even if you're saying like, okay, I'm going to buy and supplement pods, you'd have to basically buy a big bottle every week to yep. supplement that. And that gets pricey over time. So then, you know, they're cheap to buy the mandarins, but the process of upkeep for them and everything that kind of goes along with that. Um, and then the limiting factors that they have on some of the other fish that you have. Well, now this is suddenly this is not the, the value fish that you think it is, despite it looking so good, is because it's making other decisions for you on that. So that's why I don't recommend that unless somebody it's it's a must have fish, but you got to be prepared for it. I had a mated pair in 150 gallon, and I mean I had tons and tons of rock. Plus I had a, a refugium going down in the sump, you know, for pods. I was I was dosing pods all the time, like you said, weekly to try to keep them well fed. And they even they even would eat uh, they would eat black worms. They would the male would eat uh, like mice. They would eat other foods, but I mean. I just, I mean, it's so hard to keep them well fed because like you said, the amount of pods that they consume on a daily basis. Let me ask you this though. Some people contend that if they get one from biota that we'll just say that comes in eating, sometimes the biota ones to eat, even eat pellets, that they can maintain them just on that. But I still feel like you have to have a lot of pods. That's just the pot, the, the frozen and the pellets are just supplemental food. I agree with that. So okay. think about their digestive tract is different than our digestive tract. So we think of when you think of your stomach and your intestines, you've got my, you got so many feet of intestines that are just twisting it and uh, bending. So we can actually hold a lot of nutrition in our digestive tract as it's getting pulled out. Their digestive tract is a straight line. So they digest their food super quickly. So they basically have to constantly eat to keep that up. So right. even if you're feeding your fish three, four times a day, but it doesn't have enough pods. Like basically the food that you're feeding, that it's eating during that feeding, great, all well and good. But that's just, it, they'll watch it. Watch these mandarins because what you'll see is they'll flutter, stop, look, take a bite. Flutter, stop, look, take a bite. That's what they're doing. Constantly eating. And so even when you're feeding the food, that's what they're doing. So they're not getting a ton of extra food in there. It's basically just taking the time that they would have been eating otherwise on just eating that. So it's just providing another option. I know I think you need to have a, a well stocked way to doing that, whether it's pod piles, few refugium, what, uh, uh, what is it? The, the, the necrotic zone, not necrotic zone, uh, but whatever the zone is, the, basically like a rubble zone, whatever it is that you have to do, right. but it's a lot of work. And so suddenly yeah. your time, because you know, we budget for time as well is, you're doing all this work for this fish. I mean, to me, it's just not worth it on that budget. It doesn't. It, it, they're super hard to quarantine too, because unless you're willing to invest in, in constantly dose live pods for them, you're having to like hatch baby Brian shrimp. I used to have a really good success with, uh, with Nutramar Ova, but you can't get that anymore. So it's like, I've tried fish eggs. They don't really seem to go for that. So they're super, super hard fish to quarantine on top of everything else. Yeah, so definitely just skip it unless you're prepared for all that. Yep. Now, another winner, I love jawfish. There's so much personality in these guys. Uh, they are the nosy neighbors of the fish tank. So it's like if you get a, a jawfish, they may go to the back corner and hide. Uh, but within a few days, they're going to choose a new spot where they can see everything that's going on in the tank. But they also want to see what's going on outside of the tank, too. So they usually pick a great spot where food flows by, where they can keep an eye on what's going on in there. Uh, and then you've got some like uh, the tiger jawfish, uh, the one in the top right corner. That's probably one of the more common ones that's available. And these guys, they don't come out of their burrow quite as much as some of the other ones do. So it's basically just this hole with this head looking around, except for when they're getting food. And then most of these guys, what they also do is create a trap door, uh, like whether it's a shell or a larger rock. And then as it's getting close to lights out period of time, they close the door to their burrow. Um, there's also that great video of the jawfish excavating his burrow. Uh, and there's the watchman goby and pistol shrimp right next to it. So they're fighting for territory. They're putting sand back into each other. So these guys are just super comical, super fun, uh, a blast. Again, missile shaped, 
So they could be a jumper if they get startled, but generally once they have uh, their burrow spot picked out and there's enough rubble for them, if they don't get kicked out of there, uh, they usually stay put and would rather go be- retreat to their burrow than go jump. Right. Yeah. And the pearly, and there's another one, that pearly jawfish, those are super hardy, usually inexpensive. They're usually you can buy them from KP Aquatics. So once again, you're kind of like buying directly from the source. I will just point out to anyone, if you ever buy a blue dot jawfish, they're kind of prone to their own disease that they call blue spot jawfish disease, which the only way I've found of treating it up oh, <laughs> is uh, to treat with metronidazole and canamycin every 48 hours for 10 days. I'll just throw that in there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, these guys are such a cool looking fish. I wish they were not so difficult. So A, they're expensive. So you're looking at about $120 to $200 per specimen. Uh, They need cooler temps. So they're found uh, generally uh, in the Sea of Cortez is usually where a lot of them are collected from. And that's cooler waters. So we also, I find on forums and hobbyists, so many times there's that stubborn person where it's like, no, no, I can do it. I've Or they'll say that they've had success and they're talking about three months. I have not known of a single blue spotted jawfish to live longer than a year uh, in reef temps, in temps above 72 degrees. So unless you're committed to bringing everything down in that tank, uh, which is not ideal for every all, all your other tank inhabitants, just leave this for a tank that's either dedicated to itself or somebody else. Uh, and as far as jawfish go, they don't, they're kind of duds on their personality. They're not nearly as personable as the more common, cheaper jawfish anyway. So there's just so much that can go wrong with these guys. It's not worth the trouble. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, they're extremely difficult. Probably one of the hardest fish there is to keep are in quarantine. Yeah, and so I wish people would stop. I wish collectors would stop collecting them and selling them for hobbyists because this is one of those fish that can give hobbyists, the hobby a bad name. Now, this is the last one that I'm doing today. And this is a borderline. He almost didn't make the list because most of them are gen- are a little bit more expensive than what I would put on like for budget fish. So it's like I find that they're in that sixty-five to ninety dollar range now. Um, but this ends up being everybody's favorite fish in a tank. So uh, my wife, uh, she, this is always one of, along with Antheus, this is one of her favorite fish that she loves. All my friends, whenever they come over to my house, it doesn't matter the fish that I think are cool. It's everybody loves the long nose hawkfish. So these guys, even though they're on that borderline more money than what I would do for most of the other fish on here, is you just get so much bang for your buck as far as that. Just again, that that color contrast with the red and the white, the fact that they have the beak versus other hawkfish, which don't, and you just have a ton of personality on these guys. Uh, they're just really something else as far as as far as a fish goes. And these are usually safer with shrimp than like a flame hawk or, you know, other species of hawkfish, correct? Safer. Let's definitely put that caveat in there. So I find that if you get the shrimp in the tank first, and as long as we're not talking like a sexy shrimp or periclemenes, like if we're talking cleaner shrimp, blood shrimp, uh, that like if they're in there first and you get a small hawkfish, he'll be just fine with them. It's just once he gets used to anything that you put in the tank as food, anything you put in that tank is food. And so he'll, he'll hunt before he'll take that strike and hit whatever you put in the tank before okay. even checking out to see if it's edible. So, because I have had problems with that, but I have, if they've grown with the the shrimp, I don't have them problems, uh, problems with them hunting. Like if a shrimp molts or something, they usually just ignore it. It's more of just, if it gets put in the tank is like, Oh, I'm replenishing my peppermint shrimp. And okay. it's like, I hope three of the five that I add make it to the rock before they're taken out by this guy. And that's good because, you know, cleaner shrimp are now, what, 30, 40 bucks a pop. Uh, fire shrimp are like $50. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you don't really want the hawkfish eating the eating the yeah. fire shrimp or the cleaner shrimp. Yeah. Expensive meal. Yeah. So those those are what I've got for the budget. And so, again, like part of it is I kind of alluded it to a little bit is these are all fish that you can easily source. So you don't have to like, oh, it's a super rare fish or I have to wait for it to come in. It It's something that you can get at almost any fish store. Or with some of these Caribbean ones, you can get it direct from the collector right now. Any of these fish you can get right now at most places. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah. Was there any questions or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's uh, – we have some questions. So, anyone listening to this, we got some people on the live stream. Uh, if you have a question for TJ or for myself, you know, if you want to get your question in, uh, now is the time. I mean, 
TJ, like I said, is a, I consider him a fish stocking expert. If I have questions about what, what fish should I put in my tank or what fish goes with my current stocking list, TJ is the guy I'm going to ask. So you have an amazing opportunity here to, to, again, I feel one of the most knowledgeable guys in the hobby when it comes to, to fish behavior and fish stocking. So ask your questions away. Um, okay. So the first question we had here is from, okay, from Yuri. He says, I have a chalk bass in my 75 gallon tank. Can I get a different basslet like a Har Harlequin for the same tank? Absolutely. Those guys, they don't care about each other at all. You can even have more chalk bass in there, but you can do different species. They seem to just chill out and they each take their little spot and that's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Lars asks, can multiple ras species be kept together? Oh yeah, definitely. I've got, man, I've got like seven species in my tank right now. So the thing to keep in mind with wrasses is if you have a ras already in there, be sure to use a social acclimation box to introduce any new ones um, and observe how the behavior is going. Because a lot of times, so if, especially with sand bearing wrasses, if a new one comes in there, he's going to get bury, bullied. So then he's going to bury himself. And then what happens is they end up not coming out until it's a different cycle than the bullies on there. So I highly recommend using a social acclimation box because then that's also going to get them used to your light schedule as well. Is uh, Even if it's a sand bearing species for the acclimation box, don't let them put it, bury themselves. They'll get used to that schedule. They'll be able to see whatever the quote unquote threats are. The threats won't be able to get to them. So then everybody generally chills out. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Acclimation box is really a good idea. No matter what the fish is, if you're going to add a new fish to your tank, put it in an acclimation box for at least a few days, observe the behavior between the fish in the acclimation box and your other, your current stock and just see how they get along with each other. Okay, so uh, Dexter B asked, do Talbot damsels uh, keep that nice lavender pink or fade as they age? I haven't noticed much fading. So it seems to be more of a color that they're kind of stuck with. So the only times that I see fading on Talbots is, is once they really hit like super old age and they're about to die. So like once they're, you know, it's like their behavior, they kind of get a little bit more lethargic. And that doesn't last long, that period of time. It, it, a couple weeks, maybe six weeks at most. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yuri says, um, I was advised not to get a pistol shrimp because I have a glass tank. I don't think that's an, an issue, is it? Uh, that's never been an issue in anything that I've ever seen before. So their pistol defense is just that. So they don't really use that pistol firepower uh, for their building and for demolition. What they use it more for is if they encounter a mantis shrimp. Um, so again, with pistol shrimp, that clicking that you hear, that's pressurized water that's shooting out. So there's really would be no reason for them to hit your glass with that pressurized uh, uh, water power uh, because there's no threats coming from the glass. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm going through the... Okay. So Direct Cherry asks, probably going to mispronounce this. Can any of the Serenus basslets be kept in the same tank as a Royal Grama? How large would the tank have to be? Uh, they can be. Uh, so if you have, let's say, a 20 long, you could easily keep a Royal Grama and one or two Serenus basslets depending on their size. So you could easily do uh, that, uh, the Grama with two chalk basslets, uh, but probably only one tobacco basslet just because the tobaccos get a little bit bigger. Okay. Okay. Triggerfish45, uh, I guess is, it's a question here. I have a yellow flanked wrasse, blue sided wrasse, carpenter's wrasse, and a moiry leopard wrasse. And I hope to add a standard leopard as well. So I guess he's talking about the, um, the Melagra. Mel 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 yeah. Yep. Is that is that? Oh, yeah. You can do that. Leopards are usually, leopards for the most part are usually pretty cool with each other. Okay. Um, as long as it's not two males. So if you have two males, you, you might have a problem. But again, use a social acclimation box. And I would say if you have multiple leopard wrasses, make sure you have enough pods because they're both pod eaters. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. What would be your quarantine process for a Moorish idol? So I'll let you ask answer that first and I'll answer it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I recommend quarantine. However, I don't do quarantine because uh, there's a lot of areas for me to mess up. Okay. Uh, 
So yeah, so I just to let everybody know I highly recommend it. I don't have the space nor the time or the desire to do it. So what I do is I have just over UV'd my tank. Um, so I have a hundred gallon cube and I have uh, both on their own closed loops, a 40 watt UV and a 57 watt UV. Okay. Um, so it's just overly sterilized and I have, and I feel I can cheat a little bit, which is not good, which is a terrible recommendation. But when you've seen as much fish and how they behave, you kind of can avoid a lot of issues that way. Like I haven't had a noticeable disease in my tank okay. in years, but I also am not as uh, impulsive when it comes to purchasing as I have been when it was earlier in the time. And I've, I feel I've gained a lot of experience on what to identify. Um, so with a Moorish Idol, one of the biggest things that I would do is just make sure to get it eating. Yes. Uh, and once you do that, then you could probably do a lot because – at the shop at where I'm at, we keep copper in the system, and they seem to do just fine in the copper. Yeah, they're they're very. They're, the whole key is getting them eating. I mean, as soon as you get them in, I mean, the, before you expose them to medication, you want to get them eating something. Uh, I find live blackworms are sometimes a good starter food, and actually, they're they're a big nori eater. So if you put nori on a clip, a lot of times they'll start eating the nori. Once you have it eating, then it's it's really easy to use copper. They, they seem pretty uh, tolerant of praziquantel, metronidazole. Um, I've done some with chloroquine, which is another, uh, another. it's like a, you can use chloroquine instead of copper to as an antiparasitic. The only problem with the chloroquine I've found is the chloroquine has like a metallic taste. So if you're using nori, I think the nori absorbs the metallic taste of the chloroquine, making them less likely to eat it. So what I kind of do is I dip it in fresh water first let it absorb the taste of that and then put it in the tank with the chloroquine and it doesn't seem to to bother them as much. But they're actually a, a fairly easy fish to quarantine if you get an eating specimen. The whole problem with them I found is once you put them in a display tank, they don't tolerate aggression from any other fish. I mean, if, if they start getting bullied by another larger fish, that sometimes will send them off food. They sulk in a corner, stop, go off food and then starve to death. So they're just not, I mean, I think the longest I've ever kept one was five years. Um, and people tell me that's a really long time. I know a lot of people keep them a year or two and that's it. So, but, uh, so, so to answer the question, they're very tolerant of medications provided. You make sure that they're eating beforehand, before you start exposing them to copper and prosy and all these other medications. Okay, uh, Dexter B has a question. I've had my flame hawk for seven years. Would adding a long nose hawk be an issue in a three hundred gallon tank? It shouldn't be. Um, like I add the like, seven years is a long time though, so you can get that grumpy fish syndrome that kind of happens where it's like, yeah, I don't like any new perchers. But I, I generally find that flames are not too big of a problem. Um, worst case scenario is just throw them in an acclimation box and see how it handles it, especially in a, in a spot where it's the flame hawks area, so to speak. Um, in a 300, it shouldn't be an issue though. Okay. So that works out. I actually know that flame hawk fish cause I actually quarantined it <laughs> Oh, nice <laughs> for, for Dexter. Yeah. I remember that. That actually is a weird story with that fish. Um, I quarantined that fish and when I, um, had it in observation after I quarantined it, it didn't want to eat for me. So uh, what, what Dexter recommended I do said that, you know, we'll see if your wife will, because um, basically, apparently this hawkfish, this particular hawkfish doesn't like the form of men, doesn't like the shape of a man outside of its tank. But then when my wife would feed it, 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 it would eat fine. But if I tried to feed it, the fish wouldn't eat for me. That's amazing. Well, so because there have been uh, cases where it's been, I forget the guy, he wrote a book in the 90s. And it was more about freshwater fish, but he noticed that like, yes, fish would recognize even if somebody, uh, even if he had somebody wear that same shirt and came in, they would recognize that it's a different person and behave differently. Whereas if he came in, even if he was wearing something different than he was before, the fish would recognize him. Um, I think his name was Levine is who did it, man. I, there, it was, but that just brings back a memory on, on something like that where it's like, but that it, it goes to this, uh, the intelligent fish, right? Like we like, we're drawn to things that are curious. And so when you have a flame hawk that can identify gender on people, like that's pretty cool. And it's like it, behavior wise. So that's why we're drawn to stuff like that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, it wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't eat for me at all. I mean, I'd sit there, put food in the same exact food and it wouldn't eat. My wife comes in, 
puts food in, it eats. In fact, what I ended up doing with this fish, because I was worried about it, it, it would stop eating. I actually put the observation tank in my wife's office and this little flame hawk would sit there and watch her all day long. It would just sit there in the corner Amazing. while she worked on her computer. She works from home. She's an IT person. And it would just watch her all day long. And then every now and then she'd go put some food in and they got along great. It just likes women. It didn't doesn't like men. So, yeah, a little. little. <laughs> um, okay, so Lars asks, what pistol shrimp species would you recommend with Watchman gobies? Oh, uh, what, whatever you can get. I mean, I, I personally prefer the uh the randalls because it's red and white so it's like i like that color but those when i see them come in they come in so small so i like tigers as well it just i like whatever you can get on watchmen's because their behavior i don't find too much of a difference as far as their behavior except there's some caribbean species that'll come in that don't pair so then you just get stuck with a pistol shrimp that hides a lot so just make sure you get one that pairs okay Okay, Brian asks, um, how long do you keep a sand-bearing wrasse in an acclimation box with no sand? It depends. So ideally, I'd like to get them in there in about three days. But if I have other sand-bearing wrasses in there, I might push it a couple more days. Uh, just because I do have some, uh, like I personally right now have a very large female Meliagris. So if I ever try to bring in, I don't even try any leopards, but I'll try to do a Nancy smaller Nancy's. And so those generally need like about day five before the Meliagris lets them live. And then she's fine with them. But okay. if I try it beforehand, then they don't get, they get bullied a little bit. Okay. Um, one more tank asks thoughts on engineer gobies. I usually see small ones for $20 or less. I just know the thing with these, they, they get, they grow to like 12 inches. They're, they get huge. Yeah. So that, there's good and bad about engineer gobies. Uh, but the problem with engineer gobies is they did once they are done with that small juvenile size where they all school, they will burrow like nobody's business. <laughs> and they don't just keep one localized burrow. They will burrow across a whole six foot tank under everything and they will dig deep. So it's like uh, that was one of the first when I first got into the, the saltwater side of the hobby. That's where I probably had my first disease outbreak is because it was a deep sand bed tank and they ended up, I, I like them to the dwarves of Moria, right? They dug too deep until they unreached, uh, uh, unleashed the Balrog, which killed everything. And that's what happened is like, they just dug down in there. You know, the tank was always cloudy. The All the other fish were always stressed. So they can get, they have that potential. Now, if your tank is disease free, they can be super hardy. They can have interesting behavior, but they do cause a mess. Yeah, they do. They're they're very messy uh, sand sifters, and they dig they dig those big elaborate tunnels, like we talked about. And again, your rocks need to be really stable because you know if you have an unstable rock, it could cause like a rock slide. So they're uh, yeah. Uh, Direct Cherry asks, uh, do blue and orange tail spot blennies like the one in the photo you showed actually exist? All the ones I've seen were mostly brown. So they do. So that one was a, so a, yes. But you, what you need to do is, A, make sure it's very, fed very well. And B, if you can do it in a larger tank, is have a, a harem of them. So they will develop that. The males will develop that to show to the females um, a stronger contrast. Uh, they will develop. Uh, males will, uh, uh, as a nuptial display, have that. Okay. Okay. Uh, transformational coach asks any recommendations for a 120 gallon with a scopus and blue tang, two PJ Cardinals and two bonded Flacco hawk, uh, hawkfish, I guess more fish to add to the tank that would go with that, that current stock list. I mean, what are you drawn to? So it's like, that's got, you know, the, with the tangs in there, it's a little, uh, and the Felco hawkfish, that's a little bit of a, a pusher tank. So that might be a good tank for a, a melanurus ras um hawkfish would uh actually no 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 you said hawkfish they've got a bonded flacco hawkfish too yeah yeah so no other hawkfish because those guys can be jerks um yeah i, I would do a melanurus rest just thinking about that like if you can find a pentapotus like a purple sunfish i think those guys are great uh some of the larger hardier cardinals uh like the compressus uh compressus um and the ochre striped striped those would be good options um, even if you did a group of the small Chrysiptera damsels that were big enough not to get 
you know, sniped by the Felcos as they're going in, that it could add a lot of color too. Okay. Uh, Direct Cherry asks, how deep of a sand bed do you recommend for a yellowhead pearly jawfish? I know they need kind of a deep sand bed. I think it's overblown. I think you can do two inches. They'll, they'll figure it out. I found that uh, they'll just move it. So instead of it being as vertical as it is, they'll just move it more horizontal under a rock. They'll, they'll adapt just fine. Okay. Two inches. So the, and the thing with the pearly jawfish too, they don't get the, the blue spot jawfish disease, that weird bacterial infection. They don't get that. And they don't need their Caribbean fish. So they don't need the colder water. They're just fine right. in like 78 degree Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That, I think, you know, you don't see those too often for some strange reason. You don't see pearly jawfish in too many tanks. I find that Caribbean fish have fallen out of favor and I don't know why I want there to be a resurgence in Caribbean fish because even, even the wholesalers don't seem to bring them in. Like they bring in their grandmas and their handful of other species, but for some reason the jaw, the pearly head jawfish have fallen out of favor. And it just, is like one of those cyclical things that you just see. So I hope they come back more in favor and get more readily available. Like they're, they're still just as available as they were. It just stores aren't bringing them in. Yeah. Well, I mean, go to K, you know, tell people go to KP Aquatics and yeah. you can buy oh, the best there. Yeah, buy Caribbean fish all day long from KP Aquatics. Um, okay, so where are we at? Um Okay. Uh Direct Cherry asks, are there any fish that you consider to be a freebie, meaning they're so small peaceful that you can add it to a fully stocked tank without concern about overstocking? Oh, yeah, there's plenty. Like any of the small gobies, um there's like uh, circus gobies, uh, some of the small clown gobies. It just depends on what else is in the tank. Because then again, when you're looking at fish that size, uh, even fish that you wouldn't deem predatory can suddenly become predatory on them. Okay. Okay. So that, then I would say, like, still look at the stock list in general on there. Just make sure nobody's going to get bullied. So um, one of the fish we, we didn't talk about, I just kind of like to get your opinion. And I, I find these are like great dither fish, especially if you get the sail fins or the balloons. What do you feel about mollies in a, in a saltwater tank, in a reef tank? I like mollies if you get the kind that can adapt to saltwater. And so right. I find that the uh, some of the round finned ones, so like basically all almost all mollies that we have come from two different lineages. And one is more tolerant of going into this full salt water and one is less tolerant. So okay. if you find the lineage that is, they'll adapt quite well. Um, and, Cause it's like, I used to do a four hour acclimation on them. And then uh, I had a stage where it's like, I had some fuzzy dwarf lions that would only eat live food. Okay. And so I was uh, feeding them uh, mollies and a couple of the mollies escaped. So it's like, I was feeding them with tongs. And the lion, the fuzzy dwarf lionfish that I had was so bad at hunting that even at the tongs, it would hit the tongs above the molly and then the molly would get a uh, swim. And so it's like, oh, OK, well, it'll either catch this guy later or not. And then three months later, it's like I had like half a dozen mollies that I was not even acclimating at all. But they were just surviving from these stupid, clumsy lionfish. So, <laughs> yeah, I think if you get the right kind, the acclimation is even overrated. Yeah, I'm a big fan of mollies. I mean, I've personally found that the sail fin or the balloons, the, the larger ones, do better than those, the small, mm -hmm. you know, black mollies or whatever. But, you know, you can get mollies in black, silver, gold, a lot of different colors. They're they're cheap. They're inexpensive. They do mm -hmm. require a long, very long acclimation period. I actually I actually do about a week. I put them in a oh, tank, wow. tank and I take like a full week to acclimate them to full salt water um, before I, I put them in my tank. They don't need to be quarantined because any freshwater – Diseases will die off once exposed to salt water. Um, and they're great dither fish. I mean, they're just really mm -hmm. good dither fish to like, you know, make other fish feel, um, you know, calm. And they're great algae eaters. They sit there and they pick up the rocks all day long. They're herbivores. So they're constantly yeah. eating algae. I mean, I just think they're just amazing, inexpensive, cheap fish. So, yeah, but you just have to. So, as far as the budgeting, you have to budget the time, energy, uh, and how you're going to acclimate them. So it's like if more star stores would start to do that for you, that would be swell. But yeah. uh, we'll have somebody who's willing to do that. We actually have a vendor on the forum, Inverted Reef, uh, that sells. Uh, they only sell like uh, inverts, cleanup crew. They're actually now starting. They have a whole separate area where they're acclimating uh, freshwater mollies into saltwater and they're selling them. So oh, they're that's doing fantastic. It for yeah. So they're good. OK, you got time for a few more questions? Yeah, yeah. Keep okay. going. OK. Um, 
Direct Cherry asks for both of you, what fish species do you think is criminally underrated in the hobby? Oh, man. Well, uh, well so it's a few of them I said today, right? So right now I'm on a big Serranus basslet kick because I just love lantern, harlequin, chalk basslets. Uh, for you know, for a fish that you can get for fifteen to twenty-five dollars, that thing is awesome. Um, I love uh, something that's more expensive is pink streak grasses. So those guys have really jumped in price over the last few years. You used to be able to you could get them for thirty-five to forty-five dollars, and now it seems like they're closer to that hundred-dollar range, which is insane. But they are just they are such an awesome alternative to the six-line wrasse. Um, they got these bugging out eyes. They're small. They actually stay peaceful. They're a little bit more secretive. So you have to look at the tank. Um, I mentioned rhino blennies. That's one of my favorite fish of all time, uh, just because of how personable that they are. Uh, and then barnacle blennies, barnacle blennies, like those guys are great. It's like watching like a colony of jawfish that live in the rocks, but then they have their own little comical hierarchy as far as what's going on. Like that would be a, that could be a small dedicated tank for me. So for me, it would be the long-nosed hawkfish. I'm sorry, the long-nosed butterfly fish because, you know, everybody wants a wants a copper band. And we all know how difficult, they're expensive, how difficult they are to get eating. I can't tell you how many copper bands probably get killed because they die in captivity because they just don't transition to, to, mm -hmm. to, to food. Uh, but a long-nosed, same body shape. It's a different color. It's a yellow instead of that, that orange and white. But it's same body shape. It's just as reef safe as a copper band, but they're a lot easier. I have found to, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had one that didn't eat. They, mm -hmm. they eat almost right away. I've even had some eat nori, which is crazy for a butterfly fish. Um, and they're extremely tolerant of medications, extremely easy to quarantine. I think that's a really, an, an underrated fish and a fish that should be considered, you know, if you've got to have a butterfly fish and you know, you're just not having luck quarantining a copper band, I think along those butterfly is a great substitute. I love that choice. And I like my personal tastes lean more towards that brighter yellow than the copper band colors. Anyways, like why isn't it more popular? It's, it's a prettier version, but that yeah. kind of goes back to that whole idea of because copper bands have that allure of how big tricky, like yes. it's obvious. So it's like, Oh, that's a more desirable fish. But it's like, no, 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 go back to the drawing board, go back to your first stages on what's actually the prettier fish. And a little trick I found when I was selling quarantine fish, every time I would order a um, a copper band, I would always make sure I got a, a long nose that was about the same size. I'd put them in the same tank together. And a lot of times what would happen is the copper band would learn to eat from the long nose. The copper band's watching the long nose eat everything I put in the tank. And the next thing you know, the copper band's like, well, let me try that. And then you know how that goes with some of these fish. Once they get that first bite in, that's all it takes you found that starter food and then you can then start introducing other food to, to get a meeting. Yeah. That, that's a good idea because it, competition is such a, a motivating force for other fish. And that's why, you know, tanks has, are such jerks to all those laterally compressed fish, right? They, they view them as competition, but then you're utilizing that same theory to get somebody who's a picky eater to actually eat the stuff that you need with that long nose and the, and the spiky top. So it's like, He's able to see it was like, wait a second, that guy's uh, after my food. I better get there first and try to eat it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Like I said, competition is a great uh, motivator. Um, okay. Triggerfish asks, why does my starry blenny act like a D bag so often and bite my other fish? Uh, should he go to counseling? <laughs> Counseling's not going to work for that guy. He is just, so we just talked about competitive competition, right? So he is protecting his little area and he views anybody that's coming close as oh, they're trying to take something that's mine, even if they're not right. They, a lot of these other fish probably are not even, but uh, he's just staked out this area and he's got people that he does other fish that he doesn't like. And that's just what's going to happen. Most fish though. The good thing about blennies though, is they're so bulky and they don't have the swim bladder. So they can't, they're not good for a chase. Most fish are way more streamlined than them. And so they'll just avoid the jerk. Right. And like I said earlier, for some strange reason, a starry blending and a Midas blending, I've had issues with those. They 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 perch in like a little hole in a rock, and any fish that swim too close to their hidey hole, they seem to come out of the rock, they hit the tail, they run back into the hidey hole, they just seem like they're just jerks. But then for some reason, the very the extra large specimens, I call them the jumbo size mm -hmm. uh starry blennies and, and midas blennies, they don't seem to have that attitude. They just seem to perch on top of a rock and 
I guess they don't have the Napoleon complex going on. So they're just like, you know, I'm not really worried about anything. And they don't seem to be have that aggression like the yeah, small. They, they've learned it's not worth uh, to chase after everybody. Right. Exactly. Uh, let's see. Are long nose butterflies compatible with tangs? I mean, yeah, for the most part. I mean, the tang is going to, I would say, out compete a lot of other fish. But since long nose butterflies seem to be more aggressive with their eating, I think a long nose would be more compatible with tangs than a copper band. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. And so I've actually seen in, in several customers' tanks where tangs were actually in there first. And so we did the acclimation box and everybody was cool. And then when you let them out of the acclimation box, they still kind of wanted to show the newbie what was up. But it, uh, the spikes at the top of a butterfly fish, uh, they're actually really good at using those for defense. So when okay. the tanks come to straight uh, side swipe them, they kind of just put their spikes in the way and they'll keep them at bay. So it's like they generally do OK. OK, OK. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, there's no more questions. It looks like I do see Philip uh, says you need to do one of uh, one of these for freshwater sometime. Do you, okay. do, you do you do freshwater fish, too? Yeah, that's how I got started in the hobby. So, okay. uh, yeah. So the shop that I work at in Greenwich. Uh, when they first opened, they were only open uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And at the time, I was doing commercial window cleaning, but I would just stop at uh, all the pet stores in the area along my route and see what they would have. And the store that I currently work at, their freshwater expert wasn't there, so I would be answering customers' questions um, okay. because that would be the shop that it's like I could get the stuff that I couldn't uh, that I could see in books and couldn't get elsewhere. So yeah, no, that's how I got started. I didn't become I didn't get into salt water until I started working at the shop. Um, okay, so and afford it. Yeah. Maybe we could do one of these sometime on freshwater fish. That would be kind of interesting to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, which I don't see any other questions um, in the chat, um, well, I want to, you know, we've been going at this now for like an hour and a half. So, I mean, TJ, I want to thank you so much. I think this has been extremely entertaining and educational. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge uh, um, with us. And also, I want to point out that. You have you're on the forum is eat breakfast and you're I know I tag you a lot of times when I have you know people have fish stocking questions and you even have like an I'll I'll link that in the um, um, the the, re the replies of the live stream you have your own um, you have your own thread on the forum where you know if you got questions about fish stocking ask here I'll try to answer um, so if you, anyone listening has any other questions for TJ just come to humble dot fish and ask away. Yeah, well, thank you for having me tonight. I really enjoy this. Anytime I get to talk fish, this is something that I nerd out about all the time. So having having people who actually want to hear it is is good. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, we thank you, TJ. Uh, thank you very much. And we thank everybody for listening. And this is just the first in the series. Uh, I'll have to figure out what the next uh, one will be. Um, but we're going to continue to do a series on budget reefing. Maybe some of the next ones will be on equipment or on on buying tanks but we want to definitely we want to continue to try to 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 help people that are on that want to participate in the hobby but you know want to do so on our budget we want to help you any way we can to to find ways of doing that so okay well thank you again tj and thank you everyone and we will see you on the forum <laughs>